From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day on this Friday, May 20th. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. Say goodbye to a tough week. Stock bounced Friday while still heading for their longest weekly decline in 21 years. Is there any reason to be bullish? And credit cracks. High yield spreads widen the most this month since the pandemic. We're going to speak to veteran fund manager Mark Okada of Sycamore Tree Capital Partners to find out the opportunities. And earnings, you got the bad, you got the sparkly. Deere says higher farming costs are hurting demand, and Rich Mall warns on China and softening luxury demand. You got companies caught between inflation and a growth scare. From New York, I'm Alex Steele, my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. And Guy, I feel like those earnings are key because we haven't yet seen those revisions to that weaker demand. That's like the next shoe to drop. No, I'd like you to commend you. I'd l I can't remember the last time I heard the word sparkly in a headline. So good work on that. Um, it's a Friday. Uh, yeah, I think the deer earnings are fascinating. They're like second derivative margin pressure. Basically, our customers are facing margin pressure, i.e. their costs are going up so they can't afford new tractors, uh, and as a result of which, we're going to suffer as well. Plus, we've got a cost issue. Uh, the Richemont thing feels like a China story as well in, in a fairly significant way as well, uh, which is something that I think increasingly... Given what's happening with the president out in Asia, we're going to need to focus on as well. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's a lot going on today, isn't there? And none of it's particularly good, apart from the fact that you got the word sparkly in a headline. Well, good work. And, uh, yes, and also that the Nasdaq is up 1%. I think the why is really in yeah. question with that one. Well, I think after being battered for a few days, it was inevitable that at some point there was going to be a bounce. I know a lot of people are ascribing that to China I have my doubts on that. I think we've just been beaten up for a number of days and as a result of which there's an opportunity maybe to buy. But we've also got some expiries to get through as well. So we could see a few bumps along the way today. Uh, our question of the day is a fairly straightforward one. And Alex alluded to it in the opening. Is there any reason to be bullish? And if there's not any reason to be bullish, is that a reason to be bullish? Ah, <laughs> Rain Bostick, Bloomberg like the Markets. Metaverse. <laughs> oh, we're going to get we're going to go round and round on this one. Yeah. Bloomberg Markets, the close uh, co-anchor and Christina Kino, uh, European markets editor, to be found in New York for the next three months, joins us now. Remain, if we are at the point where there's no good news, yeah. is that good news? No. Uh, I mean, in, in short, no. I mean, look, uh, if there's no good news, I guess it gives you sort of the general sense here that if people are sort of expecting the worst and prepared for the worst, maybe you avoid the absolute worst case scenario. But I think the key phrase there is absolute, because uh, if we still uh, end up in a situation where uh, even sort of a fraction of the worst case scenario uh, ends up becoming uh, a reality here, it's still going to push the market down uh, well below the current levels that we're at. I think when you look at some of the economic conditions and the huge, huge slate of economic data that we're getting next week, I think people are going to be in for a real shock into, into just not just how bad things are, but more importantly, just how bad sentiment is right now. And that's the real driver of the market. Yeah. And to point that out, your area of confidence is at a negative 21. I mean, just pointing out that these numbers are really bad, whether you're across the Atlantic or here in the U.S. Um, hey, Christine, I'm, I'm wondering um, how you would answer that question, because this is the kind of weekend where my husband's going to start to panic about the Fidelity account and what happened to the S&P this week, etc. Is there any reason to be bullish? Well, listen, Alex, I mean, I'm going to take the other side of this question and say, yes, actually, there is some reason to be, if not bullish fully, then a little bit more optimistic because you know in some ways this week felt like it was the first time in a while where we actually saw two-way risk in markets you know we were talking about risk sure. on risk off sort of days and really to me that's kind of a signal that there's a little bit of normality uh, coming back to markets here I think that's a lot to do with the fact that some of the big catalysts that we know about right inflation and how that's gonna hit consumers and then what the Fed's gonna be doing about that as well as other big central banks I mean that is a sign of markets kind of digesting through some some of those big catalysts and you know really kind of coming to grips with that and coming to terms with that and that means that it's not necessarily a one-way trade in markets and so even if it's not a reason to be outright bullish certainly unhedged and um, uh, longer term it is at the very least kind of offering investors some opportunities here as guy said uh, if you know it's not necessarily a reason a uh, clear reason to be bearish then perhaps there are opportunities to be had in this market OK, let me take the other side of that again. I know I'm flip-flopping, Christine, but we'll go with it. Um, 
what, what I'm seeing in credit right now is starting to look a little bit more alarming. And I'm not entirely sure that equity markets are, are kind of on board with it, or at least are keeping up right now. We need to separate out which markets we're talking about. Credit is starting to definitely take a turn for the worst. It's, and I've heard from a lot of people that this is something that they're looking out for. Now that it's happening, do we now all now see to start to start playing catch up? Or as Alex would say, catch up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, credit is always a favorite canary in the coal mine guy. And I know we've seen credit spreads widen definitely uh, this week as they start to kind of price in what we're going to be seeing from the Fed and how that's going to impact consumers and, and just individual companies that, that uh, the credit uh, world is a lot more sensitive to. But then at the same time, you know, looking at those spreads, we're not necessarily near very real crisis levels. You know, uh, we're probably kind of around the levels that we saw in the middle of 2020 yeah. well, um, in the aftermath of COVID. Yeah, you, know, I, I, you know, I've known Christine from afar for a while now. I see her always in line. I never knew she was this optimistic here. Because when you look <laughs> at credit spreads, I mean, at least here in the U.S., on an aggregate basis, what are we up to? We're something like 150 basis points on the, uh, on the option-adjusted spread. And it's not necessarily the level we're at. I mean, although that matters. But I think the pace of which we've gone in, what, less, yep. barely a month from the beginning of uh, April to where we are today, from basically roughly 100 basis points to 150 basis points, and a lot of people sort of looking higher, saying that that's going to continue to move higher, uh, given some of the economic data we're getting. And you go back, I think you mentioned this at the start of the show, with some of the retail earnings that we got. Uh, you know, the, you we're talking about high-risk companies with a lot of these retailers, highly leveraged companies, uh, companies that, of course, are on the uh, lower end of the credit spectrum. And if they're not doing well... I think you're going to see spreads widen out a lot more before we get to a pace where they finally level off. Which also begs a question, Romaine, that, I w that we've been struggling with, too, is, like, where is the Fed put? Like, we know it's not in the equity market. Bye-bye. Yeah. But, like, there's got to yeah. be something, whether it's liquidity, uh, whether it's spread blowout. Okay. It's, oh. Okay. No, but is oh. there a Fed put? I, where, not where is the Fed put. Yeah. Is there a Fed put? Oh, I don't think there's a Fed put anymore, at least not in the traditional sense where, oh, you get a market that falls 5%, the Fed will step in. They've made it clear that they want financial conditions uh, to weaken further. I mean, they've made that very clear. I think if you want to talk about the Fed put in a more esoteric sense, yeah, there's certainly one around the ec uh, economic conditions and in credit conditions. If you see spreads continue to move higher, uh, I, I mean, I'm not going to put a number on it, but we've had strategists on uh, this yep. network that have talked about 200 basis points maybe being kind of the canary in the coal mine for the Fed. We're not there yet. So maybe that becomes a Fed put. But what happens in between okay. from 150 to 200, Guy? The, the, the Fed put, I think, is interesting because, actually, I thought Mohamed al wrote another interesting piece kind of around the Fed this week. And what he talked about was the plumbing, Christine. That's his fear now. At the moment, the Fed's fine. The Fed wants to tighten financial conditions. The Fed wants, the, effectively, the stock market to go down. But it wants to do it in an orderly way. We're starting to see liquidity drying up. Liquidity has been drying up for a while. If we start to get liquidity gaps, if the market doesn't function anymore, is that where you do actually get a Fed put? Is that the problem for the Fed? I know we're not there yet, but is that where things really start to crack? That is an excellent point, Guy, and I would have to agree. I think it really will be the, the plumbing, as you mentioned, in, in the Treasury market as the Fed kind of moves on with this tiny cycle. Again, it's a reminder to investors that it's not just rate hikes that we're talking about when we're talking about Fed policy normalization, right? There's also that balance sheet question that I think doesn't tend to get a lot of attention, but it's still very, very important to pay attention to. But in a way, as yeah. you say, Guy, that could be kind of the self-limiting mechanism for the Fed. Yeah. If they start are seeing liquidity really getting into uh, worrying levels in this sort of uh, balance sheet runoff process, then that could be something that gives them pause. And I think Rami is absolutely right. You know, yeah, there, is, there might be pain Don't to be that. had uh, in between now and 250 mm -hmm. basis points. But when we get there, potentially we get there uh, around the summertime, uh, we could see a potential turning point there, especially, yeah. as you say, Guy, the liquidity issues I, start coming up. I, I, want, yeah, I want to make a point to, to Guy's liquidity issue, too, because I think one thing that's a little bit different than maybe what we saw during past big market sort of crashes is the sort of the liquidity drying up has been a lot slower here. So, and I think that could actually play a big psychological effect, not only for market participants, but also for the Fed as well. If you don't really have that bum rush for the door all sort of in one sort of short period of time, does it really create panic if, it, if it's kind of like the slow boil, sort of putting the frog in sort of a you know, pot of cold water and just turning up the heat slowly? Maybe by the time we get to crash levels, it'll be too late for anyone to really react.
Sorry for being such a pessimist. Yeah, thanks for that, <laughs> Romain. Sure. Uh, okay, Carry great. On with the rest uh, of the so I guess we'll just uh, leave it there. No um, <laughs> but uh, I do think it's interesting to, to also then uh, key in on earnings, like we're mentioning with Deer. Like the demand destruction is real, it's here, and it's coming, and we haven't necessarily rated for that either. Um, all right, guys, thanks a lot. Bloomberg's Romain Bostic and Christina Kino. Really good round, round table. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday. Uh, well, coming up, what is the next bullish signal to look for in the market? Our next guest has a model for it. Uh, Jay Copel of Sentiment Trader is going to be joining us next. If there is no reason to be bullish for now, what about in the future? What do you look for? This is Bloomberg. If markets quit functioning, uh, it can give the Fed an excuse to actually uh, stop uh, tightening aggressively and maybe even start talking in a friendly um, way for the markets, uh, i.e. easing pot potentially. That was Longtail founder and CIO of Anir Banshali speaking with us yesterday. Let's get back to the question of the day because you look at the S&P, we're up by three tenths of one percent. Is there any reason to be bullish? Joining us now is Jay Kappel, senior research analyst over at Sentiment Trader. Jay, you got some models for this. Good Do you want to be bullish yeah. here? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the indicators that I follow are actually net bearish, so I'm not fully invested at the moment, but I do have a reason for optimism. So one of the best indicators I have come across uh, involves new highs and new lows on the NASDAQ index. And when new lows overwhelm new highs completely, uh, as it has done recently, it, is, it typically happens near capitulation, not necessarily at the bottom, but very close. So the model that uh, that I follow, it's given nine signals since 1990. The most recent one occurred last Thursday, May 12th. The previous eight signals all saw the NASDAQ rise in the next 12 months. In fact, the average gain was over 40%. Now, that doesn't mean that's going to happen this time. It certainly sounds very optimistic at the moment, uh, but it is definitely something I'm keeping an eye on. Given all the negativity, it's perfect. And it's one of those indicators, as the old saying goes, when the time comes to buy, you won't want to. Uh, and, and I think that applies yeah. right here. So uh, I'm keeping close eye on that. One thing to keep in mind, though, historically, the previous eight signals, the average number of days between the signal and the actual bottom is about six to 11 trading days. So that's uh, about a week or so, a week or two, up to a month. And the average decline from the time of the signal until the actual low uh, is, the average is about six to 8%. So picture a scenario where about a week from now, the NASDAQ is six to 8% lower. Imagine the fear and panic that's gonna be going on in the market at that point. And yes, I absolutely think that that, if that unfolds that way, would set up a terrific buying opportunity. So it's not necessarily a reason okay, to be Jay. bullish at the moment, but um, something to keep an eye on. When we get there, when we get there, if we get there, yeah. what do I wanna buy? <laughs> okay, so the big problems right now in the market, everybody knows them, inflation, rising interest rates, and poor price action. So we did a study at Sentiment Trader and we looked at when inflation is high, as it is today, and when interest rates are rising, as they are today. And when those two factors are in play, since 1926, the top three sectors have been energy, healthcare, and consumer staples. Okay, so this year, energy has been terrific. It's up, uh, XLE is up over 47% for the year. The other two, XLV and XLP, are both down about 9%, which isn't good, but it's better than the minus 18% for the S&P. And by trading those three together, your return for the year so far is a little over 10%. And I think a lot of people would be pretty happy about yeah. that right now. Yeah, absolutely, Jay. Uh, but, but let me get in here because I feel like... <laughs> One thing that may make this time different, and I say that with some air quotes, is uh, yeah, yeah. what we've seen with the retail investor over the last two years. And I'm wondering how that kind of flow and sentiment um, plays into these models. Um, they don't. They don't. They're standalone models. We look at, uh, you know, that's what we do. We're a research firm. We look at data, and basically all we're looking for is ways to find an edge in the market. And we're not necessarily looking at the even the current environment to say, well, what might happen here? Mm -hmm. In other words, we don't try to predict. We try to find, like, the question that we tell people to answer is not, 
what do we think the market's going to do next? The question really for any investor is, how are you going to allocate your capital? Because that is really what's going to decide your, uh, your fate. So uh, just to, to follow up on that, at the moment, yep. the, uh, if I may, the, the model that I follow right now is 30% in cash which is very boring and it's not making much, although it could make more as interest rates rise. And it's certainly better than minus 18% on the S&P. Plus I do have some uh, capital available if, uh, if the scenario that I talked about before unfolds. So the second part is 20% in commodities, okay, which have done phenomenal this, week, this year. They're probably due for a pullback, but I did a study uh, a while back, and based on reversion to the mean, I, it would not be surprising to see commodities continue to outperform stocks for okay. the next two to three to five years. Wow. And then, if we uh, get a the bounce rest... off the lows, the, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we touched on the equity. So, so let's, let's talk about the duration of any rally when we see it. Sure. I, bottoms, tend, bottoms tend to form quickly and bounces tend to happen fast. Right. How long? How long a kind of scenario are we looking at here? Is this we bounce into into the fall later on this year? The summer looks good. Kind of how short and sharp is this going to be, or is it going to be something that you're going to be able to trade into? Well, as I mentioned before, if, if I just focus on the indicator, the the new high, new low indicator that I talked about before, the follow-up rallies have been terrific. The last signal was in the middle, uh, late part of March 2020. And I mentioned before about how when the signal comes, you won't want to use it. Well, that was perfect, right in the heart of the pandemic. The previous signal was Christmas Eve of 2018 was followed by three of the most awful days uh, that anybody's seen leading up to Christmas Eve uh, uh, in, in 2018. We had a terrific rally. So once it starts, the thing that I'm finding is sentiment is getting very, very overdone to the downside. And everybody seems to acknowledge that. But the one thing we haven't really had yet, I keep, I keep saying this, we have fear, we have doubt, we have angst, but we don't have capitulation. Mm -hmm. We just we don't have people dumping stocks yet. Well, and uh, I, I think that it probably Jay, will grow. We yeah. only just have about 45 seconds left, but at a mm -hmm. mix of 28, what does it need to be to show capitulation? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the question? If the VIX the, is at 28 and we oh, see capitulation, oh. what does it need to be? I, I tweeted out yesterday, I said, wake me when it hits 45. Because if you look at history, uh, yep. all the big declines, it spikes to 40 or 45. So, yeah, the 30 isn't going to do it. <laughs> Fair enough. Some people are arguing that you need to look at single stock volatility maybe this time around because people are so out mm -hmm. of the options market. But, Jay, I think, uh, as you say, I think people are going to be watching carefully. Uh, Jay Kappel. Absolutely. Of Sentiment Trader. Yeah. Sir, thank you very much indeed. Coming up, ETF investors are showing signs the U.S. Treasury yields may have peaked. We're going to find out why next. This is Bloomberg. It's time for the Bloomberg Business Flash. A look at some of the biggest business stories in the news right now. I'm Richard Gupta. Another roadblock for Boeing, which is trying to get airlines in China to resume flying the 737 MAX. China Eastern Airlines has outlined several actions it needs to take before operating the MAX again. Amongst them, more pilot training and modifications to the aircraft. Boeing says it continues to work with both airlines and regulators. Shares of Ross store are plummeting in pre-market trade, the, or, or trading now. The discount retailer cut its full-year outlook and First quarter results missed estimates. The outlook downgrade follows similar moves by Kohl's, Target and Walmart. And shares of Foot Locker are higher. The chain's forecasts show the retailer is overcoming Nike's move to sell more of its shoes via its own channels. Foot Locker said it expects full-year sales and profit to be at the high end of its prior expectations. And that is your latest business flash, Alex. All right, thanks so much, Riddick. Let's go back to these markets here. The rally fading uh, just a bit. There's a lot of options that are expiring tied to equities as well as ETFs. So let's get a look at where we're positioned for that. Kitty Greifeld, co-anchor of Bloomberg ETF IQ, is looking at how investors are positioning around these moves. It's been a crazy week. Could be a crazy day. What have you noticed? 
Well, I've been keeping my eye on TLT specifically because we have seen that bid come back into bonds, which has been a little bit interesting because inflation is still super hot right now. So if you take a look at TLT, it caught my eye that if you look at short interest on this ETF, it's actually collapsed just in the past few weeks. Just 13.7% of TLT's outstanding shares are sold short at the moment. That was as high as 43% at the end of last year. And TLT, I mean, even with that little bit of a bid coming back into bonds, it's still down nearly 20 percent year to date. So the fact that you're seeing these shorts collapse at this moment, I mean, it sort of highlights this broader shift in sentiment we've seen in the markets that the fear has really turned just from inflation to worrying about growth as well. And a slowing economy that should benefit bonds and that should benefit TLT. So let's talk about the options expiry. What should we expect? Well, you probably saw the big number from Goldman that $1.9 trillion in expirations are expected today. But specifically in ETFs, it's worth keeping an eye on QQQ. So that's Invesco's NASDAQ 100 tracking ETF. It has all your big tech names. And if you look at combined put and call open interest, it's actually at the highest level since late 2007 coming into today's expiration. So the majority of that is in puts, but call open interest, it's higher relative to this fund's history, but no one really knows for sure what to ever expect on OPEX day, but That's why it's fun. <laughs> that is why it's fun. There should be some volatility coming in this fund, so keep an eye on the cues. Um, just before we wrap up, um, the SPY, so the ETF that tracks the S&P, um, are we noticing any change in those um, uh, short interest or call options? So if you look at market data specifically, you have seen short interest on SPY particularly come down, and you marry that together with the fact that you're seeing short interest, or rather short interest on SPY, it's gone up. So people are betting against stocks, they're pulling back their bets against bonds, that sort of ties into that broader picture that we're talking about, about people worried about a slowing U.S. economy as you get really a lot of big names warning about a recession. Katie, we're going to leave it there. We'll watch for the action. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld joining us uh, on what is happening around the options expiry. Uh, right now, you've got a market that is bid a little bit. It's, it's fascinating to see over the last five days uh, what you're seeing here, though. Uh, both the Nasdaq and the S&P both still in negative territory. Yes, we're bouncing, uh, but it doesn't feel overly convincing at this point. Uh, and we've got to get through uh, a few bumps along the road. Coming up, where can you find protection from rising interest rates. We are going to speak with the co-founder and CEO of Sycamore Tree Capital Partners. Uh, Mark Akara is going to be joining us. Uh, we'll talk about what is happening not only in the credit markets, where we're certainly seeing, I think, probably credit leading equities, and we've seen a fairly big move in credit this week. But we'll talk about what's happening in the CLO market as well and try and get an idea uh, of what is happening there. Is it time maybe to shift out of loans into other assets? We'll get Mark's view on all of that. As I say, Mark Akara coming up. Sycamore Tree Capital Partners co-founder and CEO. This is Bloomberg. We're an hour into the U.S. trading session. I bet everyone is happy that it's Friday. Uh, we are seeing some gains here, but how long can they really last? Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is tracking uh, some of those moves. Hey, Abigail. Hey, Alex. Yeah, a bit of a wild Friday. And this is the week mimicking the week because it's a sell the rip kind of week and day. We do have small gains for the S&P 500 and the other indexes, but much smaller than what we had earlier on the open. And on the week, you can see at one point on that big rally day, the S&P 500 e-mini futures had actually been on pace for a gain. However, with the bearish action that we've had since then, not so much. And that means that we are looking at the longest losing streak on a weekly basis for the S&P 500 going back to 2001. If we go into the Bloomberg terminal, we can see this illustrated. So we always hear people talk about this reminds me of 2018, 2011, 2008, 2001. Well, here's one reason to think that these could really be a long rolling bear market. That bear market was basically 2000 to 2003. You would have big drops followed by big gains. Right now, we haven't really seen that bear market rally yet. But who knows? Maybe this seven down weeks uh, provide some sort of ground for it. And it's also important to remember that today is options expiration, lots of uh, derivatives, uh, changing hands. The volume could uh, really skyrocket. And really, anything is possible between now and the close, as we've learned even on non-options expiration day. As for the big story, and one reason that we have uh, these huge declines, all about earnings, especially uh, for retail. Uh, but retail earnings in particular today, raw stores coming out, that stock plunging, similar to what we saw out of uh, Walmart, uh, Target, those stocks down sharply. The 
day after they reported uh, for, um, for their quarters. And there is Netflix also really leading the way down 35%, not retail. But this is the story of this earnings season guy that some of these companies just being brutally punished, not priced in at all, happening in a one day event. Uh, will this continue or are we gonna see something brighter next week? I know that Macy's reports, will they be a bright spot? We'll have to find out. Be nice to have a few bright spots out there, wouldn't it? Abigail, thank you very much indeed. That hit was certainly a bright spot. Uh, Abigail, thank you very much indeed. So let's talk about the signs of a bear market. Um, are there going to be any signs of a bear market rally? Um, well, let's talk about this. Uh, Marathon Asset... Uh, and let me start that again. Marathon Asset <laughs> Management, it is Friday. CEO Bruce, Bruce Richards spoke to us a little bit earlier on this week. High yield has now gone from low yield of 4% to a more reasonable high yield of around 7 8%. So what we see in the marketplace is the markets have adjusted. There was heavy volume in these last couple of weeks, and so there's a lot of capitulation. The markets can now move into this bear market rally, which we're entering right now. Bruce Richards, let's get another view. Mark Ocada, Sycamore Tree Capital Partners uh, co-founder and CEO. Mark, great to see you. It's been quite the week. Um, you've seen high yield widening out really quite sharply. Uh, credit markets really starting to move. People getting nervous about loans and getting out of that market as well. What do you make of the price action? Morning, Guy. It's uh, certainly uh, a, um, an interesting start to the year for credit markets. We've seen um, IG have the worst start ever in the history of that market. High yield is down over 10 that would put it number two on the list behind 08. Um, and, um, and it really is kind of interesting that nothing has really fundamentally happened within these markets to uh, spur a move like that. Uh, and one of the most important things that we're seeing to a start like this that's this ugly is really that dispersion is rising across names. Uh, the market is starting to uh, really punish those that, uh, companies that, that underperform, those that have issues uh, passing along um, some of this inflationary dynamic within their cost structure. And, uh, and that's very interesting to us. I think, I think if I were um, to think about the last 35 years that we've been in this business, um, this may be the first real cycle that we are entering in since uh, in the last 20 years, since the, so the, the uh, 2003. Mark, period. that's huge. I mean, that's a big shift. And removing that Fed put is a huge shift also. Um, you mentioned yeah. that dispersion uh, was picking up, which I would think mean there's more idiosyncratic opportunities. Where are they? Is it IG? Is it high yield? Is it CLOs? Is it leveraged loans? Well, I, I think that the theme that, that has been durable, that will work in the beginning of cycles, is always to be up in quality and in floating rates. So um, we're doing very well in that uh, part of the marketplace. Uh, and it's, but, it, it, but it's really more of a defensive call. Defense wins championships. Yeah. Think about it. Defense turns into offense. That defense in, in the fact that you're floating rate, you're not taking any sort of rate ball in here and you're participating in that. And being up in quality, uh, it has been uh, relatively uh, just a great move. I mean, just look at loans versus high yield. Loans are down a couple of points. Uh, high yield's down 10. So that outperformance is massive. Um, and I, I think that continues. But, but again, if this is more about if, if this is the start of a real cycle, which the market has not seen in over 20 years, the game changes. It's not this sort of dialogue that I keep hearing on the show, which is, you know, risk on risk off by the dips, everything goes down, everything goes up. It's more about being a good credit picker, uh, avoiding um, things that you shouldn't own because those get punished in here. And then then picking things that, that I think will turn around. There's, there's certainly much more to buy right now than there was say a month ago. Yeah. Um, and we're finding things to do that, you know, quite frankly, we think we're getting overpaid for, but, but it's early in the cycle. Okay, there's two questions there. What do you think you're being overpaid for? And I want to come back to the question of why loans will continue to outperform high yield. What do you, what do you think you're getting overpaid for right now, Mark? So let's just, let's just take a look at those two markets from a, a top-down basis. So you've got, you've got high yield, which you yielding around 8%, which is certainly better than when it was at 4 or 5 um, But loans are probably 7.5%. You're floating rate. You're not taking any interest rate risk. You are some, taking some interest rate risk and more credit risk, I would argue, in high yield. So 
on a relative basis, that's probably a better bet. If we think about high-grade CLO debt, which is a, a niche of market for your audience, but just to look at it uh, quickly, the AAA debt there is, is yielding over 5%. That's wow. better than the Barclays yep. Ag. It's AAA. You're not taking any credit risk. You're taking some ball risk, but you're not taking any interest rate risk. And you're getting paid more than the Barclays Ag. That's ridiculous to us. And we think that's that's super cheap. Um, that's that's a great. Do you, great do, you do you think that do you think that that credit risk that you're not taking does those start to emerge? A lot of people got into loans because it, it allowed them to to deal with the inflation story. But we're now moving on from the inflation story to the implications of the inflation story, which is slower growth. And I'm wondering whether loans are the best vehicle to do that with. I appreciate what you're saying about going up in quality, but nevertheless, are loans the best way to play that? Again, I, I, I mean, I, th I think if we are going to real cycle guy, this is less about talking about asset classes and more about what you do within those asset classes that matter. Right, okay. So, so again, it's, it's, there are going to be winners and losers in all of these markets. And when we talk about being up in quality in the early part of a cycle, that's, that's, that's the move. So there are things in, in high yield, there are things in CLOs, there are things in loans that are high quality and they should be fairly resilient in here. Balance sheets across corporate America are pretty good. Yeah. I mean, we, we don't have a, a real fundamental issue yet, but Borrowers that are finding fundamental issues in their idiosyncratic um, uh, sort of performance, they're getting punished. I mean, market's gappy. Those, those things can trade down, they can trade down five, 10 points in a blink. And so it's really more of a function of doing your homework, yeah. being disciplined, taking advantage of that, and that, you know, that sort of alpha by avoidance dynamic that we talk about a lot. Yeah, right. That's paying off in here. Um, but on, on the flip side, it's like Mark? you. you Yes. Um, you mentioned that we're still early in the credit cycle. I wonder how long do you think that, if we are in this kind of credit cycle for the first time in 20 years, how long do you think it actually lasts? Like, what are the phases that you're looking for? This could be years. I mean, this is a much larger market than we've ever seen. I mean, credit as, a, as an asset class has grown multiples and multiples of the 2001 period, for, for example. Um, and and so it it will take a long time to readjust this. I think this a dynamic of the Fed put being gone, and that's kind of our view. It, it, as interest rates have gone in this long term declining trough, and now are starting to flatten out and probably go back up in, in general. Um, that lack of the Fed put means that you better be um, comfortable with what you own. Uh, and if yep. as if you don't, you're not going to get to sell it to someone else later on when rates are lower. So you better be good about your homework and that risk premium is rising and it's going to take a while. It just, it will take, you know, potentially years to get through all of this. Wow. Mark, one final quick question. You just talked about how gappy the market is. Things moving pretty quickly. Yeah. Are you seeing any liquidity problems? Is the market functioning? The market is functioning, but I wouldn't say it's completely open per se. High yield's not really open. Uh, you can't do a new issue CLO right now, but there is liquidity. There is a buyer at a price, and that's the, that's the reason why the market is gappy. The, the, that price at times is, you know, certainly not what you would want it to be. Um, and and I think that that makes sense uh, given the fact that it's a little bit early in the cycle um, to the step we adjust to this new reality of where we're at with dispersion. I think people will step in and buy some of these things. We certainly are, are looking at a lot of relval. The names that are higher quality that are down four or five points, and we think that's are a buy. So, so at, as that starts to happen, you will see a, a, a better functioning secondary market, mm -hmm. a little bit more flow, and the bid ass will come in. Hey, Mark, it's really good to catch up. It's going to be quite a week, and lasting a few years, I'm sure we'll get you back on the show as well. Mark Ricotta, Sycamore Tree Capital Partners co-founder and CEO, thank you very much. All right, coming up, you got President Biden kicking off his Asian trip with a visit to a Samsung factory just outside of Seoul. We're going to discuss the U.S. strategy in Asia with a former official of the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, Amy Selico of Denton's Global Advisors. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Ritika Gupta. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, David Salby, the anchor and managing director and portfolio manager, joining Bloomberg Television, 3.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg.
keeping you up to date with news from around the world. Here's the first word. I'm Ritika Gupta. Former New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is running for Congress. De Blasio told MSNBC he'll seek the Democratic nomination for the 10th Congressional District, which includes parts of Manhattan and Brooklyn. The primary election will be August 23rd. President Biden is in South Korea, where his immediate focus was on the semiconductor shortage that has dragged on the global economy. The president toured a Samsung factory that has some of the biggest chip production lines in the world, and he has a message for Congress. Hopefully soon, the Bipartisan Innovation Act will deliver historic federal investments in U.S. research and development, including funding for something called the CHIPS Act to revitalize the U.S. semiconductor industry. Meanwhile, Samsung is breaking ground this year on a semiconductor factory in Texas. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Alex. All right. Thanks so much, Ritika. Let's get more on Biden's first presidential trip to Asia. I want to bring in Amy Selico, Denton's global advisor's principal and head of China practice. Um, Amy, if President Biden comes back to the U.S., what would be a win? What would he be able to say, this was my trip and this was what made it awesome? Well, great to be with you, Alex. What m will make it a win for the president is if he can deliver messages to the community in the Indo-Pacific and messages back home that resonate with both audiences. In the Indo-Pacific, of course, reinforcing the fact that the United States is capable of leading a global effort to thwart what Vladimir Putin is doing in Ukraine at the same time that it can reinforce that it wants to continue to be a security leader in the Indo-Pacific and an economic partner to the countries there. That is the message that he wants uh, to, to deliver there while he's not going to China on his first visit to Asia. He'll only be in South Korea and Japan and speaking with other leaders in the Indo-Pacific from there, he's certainly going to be talking about China and dealing with the highly competitive relationship that the United States has with China, with all of those leaders. Back home, as we saw in his visit to a Samsung factory, he's talking about what the United States needs to be doing in order to have Indo-Pacific partners as part of the American economy, Samsung investing in a semiconductor uh, chip facility in Texas in order to make our supply chains more resilient, employ more American citizens, strengthen the U.S. economy at home. What does failure look like, Amy? Failure, unfortunately, Guy, would, um, I think, be um, the most possible, although I do not think probable, in the economic message uh, that the president wants to deliver to Indo-Pacific countries, that the United States is not just a strong security partner, which it certainly is, and it's demonstrated already. But it is going to be, uh, the president will be rolling out the Indo-Pacific uh, economic framework uh, while he is in Tokyo. He'll be inviting other countries as uh, to participate in the launch. Uh, the Biden administration has been very busy since last fall talking about this economic framework, which has four broad pillars and inviting countries to join. Mm -hmm. And so far, in advance of leaving, the White House signaled that there could be as many as 13 participants in this launch of the economic uh, the economic framework, Indo-Pacific economic framework, failure is if the countries say, this sounds okay, but we don't think it delivers what the United can, States must do to be an economic leader in the region. Amy, can a country sign that agreement and also still be friends with China? Uh, that's been a real um, point of contention for especially a lot of the Southeast Asian countries, but even for South Korea, for the new president of South Korea. How does he balance, obviously, already having a very strong uh, security relationship and, and rock-solid bilateral alliance with the United States? And he, the South Korean leader needs that as we're dealing with instability on, in, in North Korea right now. But the South Korean president has not, as he threatened to do while he was running for office, you know, disavowed the, the, the necessity of having a strong economic relationship with China. And so what we have heard is for this Indo-Pacific economic framework, 
the, the Biden administration watered down some of the requirements to join so that one, countries don't have to take a strong stance against China, and two, they don't have to sign up for something that they're not sure that they want to remain in. And so participation yep. uh, next week in, in the launch does not mean that all of these countries are going to end up signing onto this new framework agreement. Amy, if North Korea fires a series of missiles while the president is in the region, how does the United States respond? Well, I think the United States is in a pretty good position to deal with that. Jake Sullivan talked about that possibility um, as they were looking at contingencies uh, while the president is in the region. The North Koreans have a habit of, uh, of doing missile launches uh, while there are Americans in the region. And of course, they haven't done a nuclear test in a few years. And so that is, that is, uh, a, prob uh, that is a very, very strong possibility. I think the U.S. government is going to reinforce with South Korea that they'll enhance that missile defense systems uh, in South Korea. Uh, the U.S. government has not been willing to respond positively to South Korea's request that there be nuclear weapons stationed on the southern part of the Korean peninsula, because that would be so provocative, not only for uh, North Korea, but also towards China. And so the U.S. feels that it has the ability uh, to continue to act together with partners and allies, unfortunately, less yep. possibility to work with China on that, but to come together in the face of a more significant North Korean threat. Amy, great to catch up. Haven't seen you for a while. Really interesting stuff. Amy Selico of the Denton's Global Advisors uh, Advisory Group. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, coming up, what are we going to hit? Deer hit by cost pressures. It's actually the cost pressures of its customers, i.e. farmers, they, as a result, are going to buy less equipment. Shares of the world's largest ag agricultural equipment maker down, down sharply today. We'll talk about that next. This is Bloomberg. Market rolling over a bit, S&P down by two tenths of one percent. A big part of that is deer. That stock down by about 11 percent. At one point, we saw the biggest drop uh, since March of 2020. It's all about costs and then what the demand destruction is. The analyst call is going on right now. Joe Doe covers agricultural uh, sector as well as many other commodity things for us, and he joins us now. Joe, you're listening from the call. Um, what did you learn? The analysts are calling this really messy. What happened? I think a lot. A lot of people were wondering going into the call, listen, you guys missed revenue by about a billion dollars of what the Wall Street average estimate was. They're trying to figure out, wait a minute, we've known about the supply chain issues. Um, so what's really going on here? I think in the call, they've basically said, listen, back half of the year, uh, we expect the supply chain situation to remain constant. That means they don't see it getting worse, but they also don't see it getting that much better. And I, I think this also comes, as one analyst told me in a call earlier this morning, at uh, timing-wise, at a bad time when the rest of the market's been getting crushed because of supply chain issues, right? You had Target and Walmart coming out with their information. And uh, coming yeah. out and saying that the supply chain issue and the inflation stuff is hitting you is, is just poor timing all around. But we kind of knew that, Joe. What struck me yeah. about what they were saying was that farmers are starting to feel that margin pressure as well. Ag costs yeah. are going up, diesel's going up, all kinds of things are going up for their customers. And as a result of which, that's going to mean they're less able to purchase new agricultural equipment. Exactly, Guy. I mean, one of the things that we've had as kind of the, you know, the trump card here for deer is that uh, regardless of drought or, or war, Farmers still need equipment, right? Um, but uh, one of the things we started hearing in the past month and a half, especially uh, from one of our guys, uh, Machinery Pete, had been talking to a lot of farmers and, you know, out in the field saying, hey, listen, these fuel prices are really starting to get to us. And to hear Deere say it, I think it has an especially, uh, it, it's much more impactful to the market. And so there is a worry that if you have high fuel costs, uh, that these farmers maybe won't have the cash to spend on new equipment. Maybe they'll just keep running out older equipment and, and doing repairs, and that's obviously a big concern here in the market. 
Joe, we'll leave it there. Great stuff. Thank you very much indeed. We'll let you back, get back to the call. Really appreciate it. Bloomberg's Joe Doe listening in on what Deere's management is saying right now. Um, what have we got for you? We're going to be talking next about the European close. We're coming into the end of what is a bumpy, bumpy week. Uh, we're going to be talking about the economic story as well. Let me just give you a quick price check. European stocks are actually big. We're just north of 4.30 right now. We're up by around 9 tenths of 1%. The euro dollar is on offer, but we're still north of 105. The UK 10-year is on offer as well. Yields coming up. We're going to talk about the economic picture here in Europe in a little bit more detail. Moritz Kramer, chief economist at LBBW, is going to be joining us next. We'll get his take on what is happening. Where does the eurozone go next? Where does the UK go next? That conversation to follow. This is Bloomberg.